Good morning, I guess. Well, for me, it's morning. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the April safety meeting for beach transportation. Um, just a little disclaimer, this instruction is for the bus drivers of beach transportation as part of their annual ongoing training. This is the April safety meeting. So let's get started. Um, in the background, a little spring happening. We're gonna talk about spring hazards and preparing for spring driving, which is here now, thank goodness, right? So let's uh, get things going here. Maybe, there we go. All right. So put a little spring in your drive. A uh, beautiful spring morning there in uh, Missoula, Montana, overlooking Chief Charlo School. So what are the hazards of spring? Think about those and we'll go through those. Um, but spring brings its own kinds of hazards. We've just come off of uh, winter, we're, we're working on getting the end of the year uh, under our wheels here. So, but one of the, uh, some of the things that you see in the spring are the road conditions that are constantly changing. You've got all that spring breakup, got some problems with our roads. Changing weather, allergies come into effect with both you and the students. Fatigue, construction, of course. Bikes, motorcycles, pedestrians, lots more of these. And then student behavior uh, becomes a little more animated. Okay, so road conditions. This is a, <laughs> I don't know, I think we have a few roads like this in Missoula, but lots of potholes. <clears throat> so when we have potholes and that spring breakup, if you can, try to avoid the worst of it. So straddle the holes, put your wheel over here. Uh, this is a narrow, narrow road, but try to avoid the potholes as best as you can. If you can't, if the road is so bad, then you need to slow down so you're not um, breaking tie rods and axles and, and uh, deflating tires. Slow, careful. Changing weather. So in one day here in Missoula, we can have snow showers, we can have rain showers, we can have sun, we can have hail, we can have fog, we can have ice. Um, those can all happen within one day. So think about how do the, con the conditions, the weather conditions affect your driving? Well, I'd like you to think about with each type of weather we look at, <clears throat> and then how do the conditions affect your students? Rain. So at this point, you know, we've kind of gotten rid of the ice, although we might have a little bit. Uh, rain tends to slow you down. You can hydroplane in the rain. Um, things that you're watching for get a little distorted. People hurry about in the rain. Okay, so that kind of brings us to your students. They may um, come to the bus quicker before you stop, maybe to get on the bus to get out of the rain. They may um, stand in a place that has shelter where you may not see them as well when you pick up students. So rain has an influence. Puddles, how does that affect you? Well, this is uh, something that couldn't have been avoided. He, this driver's not doing this just to make the splash. You can see there's a car next to them. Um, and I wouldn't advise doing this. I mean, you could flood your engine out. You could 
get your windshield to where you couldn't see. You could splash a pedestrian. It looks kind of fun though, doesn't it? Um, puddles can affect you, not knowing what's at the bottom of that pothole when you hit that puddle could um, be very hard on your bus. How do puddles affect your students? Well, they like to play on them. So they could be out in the road. They could be wet feet when they come in, um, slip on the stairs, those kind of things. Okay, early morning fog, and we've talked about fog before. Fog distorts how you perceive um, objects that are in front of you and back, you, back of you. It's easy to get disoriented, not know exactly where you are on your route. Fog is gonna slow you down. For your students, it's gonna make them to where you can't see them until you're right there by them. You're gonna have to be careful with your bus stops, making sure you don't miss kids, uh, making sure that they're off the road in a safe place. Freezing rain, um, roads are gonna get slippery. Spring snow, back to winter driving, going slow, being careful. Early morning glare, since we've had the time change, uh, that sun is definitely in your face in the morning on the morning bus routes. Uh, good time to put, make sure you have a good pair of sunglasses in your bus or bring them with you um, or put an old pair of sunglasses in your bus that you don't um, need in your everyday driving or life. For your students, um, it makes visibility of your students pretty hard. So watch that as you pick up, drop, well, mostly picking up in the morning. Okay, allergies. Allergies are a spring problem, and I think they started a little early this year. Uh, clogging nose, you feel kind of miserable. <clears throat> Same with the kids, sneezing, runny noses, watery eyes. Makes it pretty hard to drive, though, for sure. If you are taking medication, please make sure it's medication that doesn't make you drowsy. So watch that. Read your labels. Talk to your doctors. Make sure that you've got something that doesn't affect your <clears throat> uh, abilities to drive the bus safely. Okay, construction, that's uh, part of spring and it goes into summer and into fall, but we've already got construction starting in Missoula. <clears throat> so what if it affects your bus route? If you're uh, gonna drop off some students on a road and they have it blocked off, what do you do when you can't drop your students off at their stop? Well, first of all, um, consider the age of your students. If it's, you know, your, your young grade school kids, K through three, you're gonna need to call base, uh, figure out a good safe plan for them while that construction happens. Maybe having parents bring them to a, to a, a bus stop that's real close uh, maybe pick them up after school or meet them because this construction zone is a big draw, a magnet to younger kids. We don't want them getting hurt just because of their curiosity. So you may need to adjust where your bus stops are. <coughs> and if you have questions about that, come in and talk to the office and we'll get you a new bus stop and make sure parents are contacted. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, route times can be affected. You might have to slow down if it's a big construction project and you're having to go through that every day. It's going to slow your, your route times down. Make sure you talk to your riders, your parents. Let them know that you might be a little late. Sometimes you have to adjust your route um, to where you're avoiding that construction area. That seems to be the best option. But if you have to drop off or pick up students in that area, 
there's got to be some uh, flexibility. Okay, as drivers, you need to drive cautiously and slowly around the workers and machines. They get preoccupied, they get busy. Um, they might step out into your lane, be very careful. Of course, like I said, be flexible and patient. Eventually they'll get it all fixed and uh, out of the way. Um, right now they have, they're working on a water main right behind our office. So those of you who park on the triangle um, are not able to do that right now. So kind of an example of being flexible. Bikes and motorcycles increase during this time of year. Why are bicycles and motorcycles so hard to see at times? Well, for one, our brains are very complex. And when we drive, most of the time we're looking for another car coming from the right or the left or being around in our space. So our brains are kind of programmed to look for a car, a vehicle, a truck. Um, so the bicycles don't register right away because we're kind of overlooking them. We're compensating um, with our brain. So it's time to kind of change that and specifically watch for bicycles, watch for motorcycles. They're small, they're at a different level than the cars are, and they come from different angles than a, a car would, a vehicle. So adjust your thinking to watch for motorcycles and bikes. And bikes don't always follow the rules. They move quick and they're unpredictable. In Missoula, we have bicycles all year, but now that spring's here, there's gonna be a huge increase. Okay, motorcycles, same thing. To be safe and keep them safe, we have to share the road. Um, some of our narrow roads, we have some complications with bicycles. Um, Rattlesnake is a big one that I think about. We have a lot of bicyclists on Rattlesnake Drive or on Van Buren. And um, there's not a lot of room. And they tend to ride real close to the, the line on their bike, um, their bike path. So please give them lots of space. If you need to, follow them until you can get around them safely. But try not to drive right next to them. Um, it's, it's pretty hazardous, pretty unsafe to get close to them. If they feel pressured, they might panic. They might tip that bike over and then they're underneath your bus. So we don't want that to happen. So be, be patient, slow down, watch. Rock in your seat at intersections and look for those bikes. Be extra careful. Okay, pedestrians, lot, a lot more pedestrians now that the weather is warmer. Um, walking to and from school in their yards playing. There's many adults outside walking, lots of dog walkers. So watch for people. Have to be aware of sudden movements and unsafe actions. If a toy goes into the road, they may follow it, children. Um, if a dog gets loose, the owner may follow it. Um, be very careful around pedestrians. Okay, give wide space, go slow around them. Same with bicycles. Okay, student behavior increases this time of year. Uh, the students, have kind of the same problem we have. It's lighter outside. Uh, in the evening, it's when it's time for bed, it's, it's lighter. So you stay up a little later. You're more engaged in activities. You can be outside longer in the evening. Uh, they get tired. School, they're sitting in their desk and it's nice and sunny outside. So they're restless. Windows go open in the buses which causes um, some behavior issues. I would encourage you to only put these windows down halfway 
enforce that rule on your bus. It still allows the airflow, but it doesn't allow as much um, interaction between student and window. They're not as able to get their bodies out those windows. Okay, we're gonna see a lot more skateboards coming on and our rule at beach transportation is no skateboards. If they bring that skateboard in a enclosed bag, you're not even gonna be able to tell it's a skateboard. And in my opinion, at that point, it's contained. It's not gonna be a flying hazard. But um, if they come up your stairs with a skateboard in their hand because they rode it to the bus, we are not to allow skateboards to come on the bus. Okay, and you might, you know, being a human being, you know that it's gonna happen. And maybe that first time you say, well, I can let you today, but it's gonna have to stay up here in front. I usually tuck it behind the garbage can or behind the seat, someplace it's secure, but let them know that that is the only time, the first and only time they can bring that skateboard on the bus. So they get a one chance in my opinion, um, but skateboards are, are not allowed on our buses. What happens with skateboards if you have an accident, they become flying projectiles. They can be very, very um, damaging to um, skin, <laughs> heads, uh, so no skateboards. Uh, students are full of energy in the spring. It's just kind of like a, a herd of calves or a little herd of lambs. They run and jump and play and uh, they just are way full of energy. Drivers on the other hand, when it gets warm, uh, get a little drowsy. So please take care of yourself. Uh, spring is, is a time where we, we tend to do a lot more. We're coming out of hibernation if you want to call it that, uh, cabin, cabin nation, hibernation. But we tend to do more things. And, and by the time we get to our bus in the afternoon and the sun's coming in and it's warm, can cause some drowsiness. So please take care of yourself, get enough rest, um, get a little oxygen, a little more exercise, eat right, Okay, driver's behavior. Besides being drowsy, um, we're getting to the point where we're ready to be finished for the year. And I know we still have a couple months left, but you know, oh, it's spring, we wanna go do other things. We've got that hint of summer and we're just getting started to be ready for the finish of the school year. So our attitude changes a little bit. We become complacent. We still need to be responsible driving that bus. So complacency, it's that feeling of contentment. I've driven this bus all year. I know where my stops are. I know which kids, I know what hazards are out there. I can just kind of drive on autopilot. We're pleased with our ability regardless of the dangers out there. We're not as alert. Sometimes we get route hypnosis, which means just driving the route on autopilot, driving um, over and over causes that. You don't see what's around you that's new, that might be a hazard. You just kind of take for granted everything's gonna be okay because it has been since September, okay? With complacency, you need to, to fight back against that. It's really easy to get into that, that complacent attitude. Stay alert. So get enough rest, get some oxygen, go out, take a little walk, um, get a little exercise, engage your brain in things that make it work a little harder, um, maybe puzzles, maybe just using your left hand to do some of your right hand um, chores. Try brush, brushing your teeth with your left hand if you're right-handed. 
or your non-dominant hand. Try eating breakfast with your non-dominant hand, which will force your brain to uh, kick it up a notch. Alter your routine. That could be doing your pre-trip a different order. It could be driving to your first stop um, in, a, in a different way, taking a different route. Uh, try to develop a new good habit. Look at what you're doing as far as your driving and try to work on one of your habits. These things make your brain work a little better. Uh, and during the spring, when we're getting complacent, this will help you kind of keep the edge to your to your driving. Okay, spring hazards recap. There's many changes in the spring. Roads and weather affect your driving for sure. Student behavior escalates. You need to get on that right now. Go back over the rules, let them know. When you start putting windows down, let them know windows are only halfway. Write students up for um, behavior that's not, uh, when they're not trying to change after you've talked to them a couple of times. Um, your driving changes in the spring uh, as far as complacency. Okay, so we're going to move on a little to field trips. In the spring here at Beach Transportation, we have many, many field trips, uh, many destinations that the teachers want to take their kids. Um, Education-wise, they want to get out of the classroom, do some hands-on things. So some things to think about with field trips, being prepared for an extra trip. Work orders, which is the paperwork. Doing that paperwork. Student management on the buses on a field trip. Finding your way to an unknown destination or an unfamiliar destination. And then watching for hazards when you're in an unfamiliar place. So this is almost the opposite of complacency. When you're out on a field trip, you can't be complacent with your driving. There are too many new things that you need to watch for. Okay, so preparing for an extra trip. Here at Beach Transportation, we have an availability sheet. That's where Josh, our dispatcher, decides who can go on a field trip, what works with their specific route, um, that comes into factor. Seniority comes into factor. Who is available from that particular school at that particular time comes into effect. So just because you're on the very first sheet, you may not get a field trip out of Chief Charlotte because they're leaving right after school starts and your bus is at Rattlesnake. Okay, so let me back up that. That availability sheet is in the, the employee lounge, and it's right on the table as you come in the back door. Um, read the instructions on that availability sheet. If you're able to go any time all week, you just check a box. If you have some things that are on your agenda that you couldn't drive, there are you just circle that day and put when you're available. Okay. Kind of self-explanatory if you read the directions. Okay, some of the skills of a good field trip driver. Maybe you're not ready to drive a field trip, but we're looking for someone who's professional. They're polite in all situations, even if things turn a little nasty out there. You're flexible. Sometimes our field trip people decide they want to be picked up early or um, dropped at a different location or picked up at a different place. You're safety-minded. You're watching the bus, all four corners, making sure it's safe. But more, more so, you're watching 
the behavior of the students. You're aware of what's around your bus as far as um, students and things that could be uh, a hazard. Then can you think on your feet or your wheels? Because you're going to places that are unfamiliar, you're gonna have unfamiliar hazards. You may have to make quick decisions to keep this bus protected to keep the students protected. Okay, work orders, paperwork. When you get your work order, look over all the pages. Sometimes on the second page, it's going to have your return trip. Sometimes on the second page, it's going to give instructions as to where to load, um, things to take with you. Maybe they have a cooler that they want to load, um, what time you need to be there, who's in charge. But don't just look at the front page and assume you know what's going on. Look over all your pages. Identify who is going, when they want to go, and where they're going. Any other important information? Where do you load at the school? Um, where are you dropping off at the university? Okay, I'm just going to go through a work order. For those of you who haven't seen one, I get all this other stuff off the screen. This is a work order, and I'm just going to go through each little section just so you have an idea. So the top section has um, who's, who's the boss. Terry Phelan is our uh, representative or mediator or uh, person that we work with through the district. But the group is going to be Chief Charlotte, fourth grade. And the contact um, probably would not be Terry Phelan. It would be the teacher or the school. This is the number of the work order. And it says you are bus one of two buses. So there's two buses making this field trip. Um, Valerie, Val, um, I apologize for using your name here, but this is Val. Uh, driving 204, and it's a 71 school bus, 71 passenger, PAX indicates passengers. Now, no, you're not going to cram 71 people in, but that's what a, a big bus is designated as, is a 71 passenger. Okay, the second portion is you are on duty at 8 o'clock. You need to pick up Chief Charlotte at 845, which means you need to be there by at least at the latest 840. I would say, you know, 835 maybe ready to go. You're going to drop off at Traveler's Rest in Lolo, Montana at 910. And then you're off duty at 930. So when you're filling out this portion, um, on duty should always be exactly this time, 8 o'clock. You put 8 o'clock over in this blank. Pick up at Chief Charlotte might vary, however. You might get there at 8.35, and at 8.45, they haven't come out. At 8.50, they haven't come out. You finally call base at about 8.55, and they're on their way, but you might not even pick up Chief Charlotte until 9.05. So put the exact time that you leave Chief Charlotte, which would be 9.05. Then dropping off at Traveler's Rest, you're not going to make it there at 9.10 because you don't can't make it in five minutes. So this might be 9.20. Put that accurate time. And you're back at the office at 9.55. Okay. So everything besides this very first check-in time can be variable. And this is going to be true, accurate time that you put on these little lines. 
Okay. This is some of the instructions, your itinerary load group in front of the school. The driver will drop and return to get the group at 1120. So you should have a sheet that tells you about your return trip. The bus will be full with 54, 54 passengers. Okay, at the bottom portion of this work order, you need to put down your starting odometer. Where, What was your odometer when you started? Now, sometimes this gets a little confusing. Maybe you have just done your, your bus route. Um, so put your odometer from the start of the school where you pick them up. Then your ending odometer would be at the end of where you come back to the office. Add your total miles. And route of travel, if you were going to Traveler's Rest, you could put Highway 93, Highway 12. Most of the time, if you're just in town, let's say you go from um, one of the schools, uh, Paxson School, to the university, you can just put local, L-O-C-A-L, -L, local, not loco, crazy, but local traffic or in town would be fine. Um, most field trips don't require meals, fuel, or miscellaneous, and you can disregard most of this. That's for going out of town, sometimes overnight. Then at the bottom, it has a little bit of a, uh, an encouragement or a, I don't know, a, a standard. It says, remember, you are a professional driver. Think safety at all times. Drive at a speed as dictated by the law and the conditions of the road. It's your responsibility to dress appropriately. Be well-spoken and well-groomed. You're representing the company. It's also your responsibility to keep your bus clean, fuel the bus if needed, dump the restroom, and you don't have a restroom on your school bus, and promptly turn in all paperwork at the office. Paperwork does not get recorded if you don't turn it in. Um, your pay is generated by your paperwork. And Josh works really hard to keep that paperwork up to date. So please turn in that paperwork as soon as you are finished with that field trip. So the same day. Remember, you are the company. If you're helpful, enthusiastic, and concerned, People will be impressed with you and the company you represent. Be concerned with excellence. Treat customers royally. And then I certify that all information contained herein and attached is true and correct in all respects. This becomes a legal document with that statement. I've also completed my daily pre-trip and post-trip inspection, reported any damage, checked the vehicle for sleeping passengers, and turned in all items left on the vehicle. When you sign this form, you vow or you assure that you have done these things. Take it seriously. Um, field trips are a privilege. They're not something that, um, that we continue to give to people who are rude or disrespectful, who um, don't get along with the people that they're transporting, that have dirty buses, that are um, that don't take care of their hygiene, that don't take care of themselves. Uh, we don't keep giving field trips to people who <laughs> uh, crash into things. Field trips are are an extra, um, and they can be really really fun. You get to go some to some interesting places. Uh, and it gives you time to get out and away. And sometimes if you're just sitting around waiting for them to come out, you can read a book. You can, you know, take a little walk around. Kind of fun. Field trips are. Okay. Student management on field trips. All the safety rules still apply, which means if you have seat belts, they should be in seat belts. Uh, there should be a supervisor on the bus. Sometimes with sports, there are not. You'll pick up at the school and take them to another school and the 
um, parents come and pick them up after the game. So the teacher usually or the coach usually drives their own vehicle. That would be a something that where you wouldn't have a supervisor, an exception. If you need to, for student management, um, manage those students, pull over in a safe spot. Your best option is to say to the coach or to the teacher or to the adults on the bus, um, hey, we have kids hanging their heads out the window. Could you please go take care of them? That's really why they're on the bus. And I know sometimes those teachers decide it's it's their field trip too, and they're gonna relax and, and take a break and they're on their phone, but they should be your first resource. If they don't take care of it, you need to take care of it. We can't transport students when they're um, having unsafe behavior. Okay, finding your way. If you don't know where you're going, ask somebody. Um, don't get out there and say, oh, I've got to go to the peace farm and I'm not quite sure where that is. Um, I'll kind of wander my way. I think it's in the rattlesnake someplace. Um, don't make yourself look silly uh, or uninformed. Ask before you go, know where you're going before you leave the office. Use streets and trips, um, use Google Earth, GPS on your phones. Um, when I was just first starting field trips, and sometimes now, if I don't know where I'm going, I will take a drive and go find it. Make sure I know where it is, where I'm going to get the bus in, how I'm going to get turned around, those types of things. I like to know. I don't like to look foolish when I get out in, a, in an unfamiliar place. Okay, hazard zones. Because you're in an unfamiliar area, there's gonna be unfamiliar hazards. Tree limbs, rocks, um, curbs, overhangs, uh, bridges, okay? Tight turnarounds, narrow roads, gates, entrances. You, don't, you won't know where to park. These are all things that you have to assess when you get to that place or when you get to that hazard, you've got to make good, safe choices. Parking lots are not our friend. Um, we've had many, many, many accidents in parking lots because they're tight. There's lots of obstacles. Um, and big buses just don't fit in all parking lots. Okay. In conclusion for field trips, know where you're going and how to get there. Fill out your paperwork, turn it in promptly, fill it out accurately. Use safe practices when backing and only back when necessary. Use a spotter if you have to back. And my advice is to get out of the bus, look around you before you back up. Be very aware of your bus height, your weight, and your width. Your bus weight, your bus width. <laughs> Um, in tight spots, drive slow and use your mirrors. Parking lots are dangerous, things to think about. Okay, lastly, I'd like to cover our spring emergency evacuation drills. These are going to be due um, April 19th, which gives you two and a half weeks to complete these. Um, there's a sign-up sheet in the driver's lounge and it's right above the sink on a clipboard hanging on the wall right above the sink by the coffee pot. Um, when you do your evacuation, come in, fill out the date that you did that evacuation under your bus number. If you have more than one group, if you have grade school and high school, um, you need to do an evacuation for each group. Okay, um, I'm going to make an executive decision on the preschool. And at this point, I would like you, if you're transporting preschool children, early kindergarten children, I would like you to 
confer with your attendant and decide how you would do an evacuation with your group of kids um, and not actually do that evacuation at this time. Okay, but it needs to be talked about with your attendant so that you know what to do in case of an evacuation with your little tiny people. Who's going to undo which kids from their car seats? Who's going to start at the back? Who's going to start at the front? Um, and, and communicate together to make that happen. Okay, so if you're going to do an evacuation drill, it, it should not be a secret. The reason we do these is to prepare you, the bus driver, but also to prepare the students in case of an emergency. So this drill should not be a surprise. Um, it's a training opportunity. So have a pre-plan before you do your evacuation, prepare the students a day or two before. Um, and it might take two days so that you're not um, wasting a lot of time at the school, putting yourself late on your route. Spread it out, give them the information about where the exits are. Um, talk about the emergency equipment, like the fire extinguisher, the radio, how the radio works, where the first aid kit is. Um, designate some helpers. If you're gonna use the back door, you need at least three helpers. You need one that's going to be the person who goes out the door, maybe third, but they go to a designated place away from the bus. And they're going to be the one that says, everybody come over here to this spot. You also need, if you're using the back, two helpers that can get out first and then help the, the younger students or those who are a little shorter on one one end get out of that bus safely because on the big buses it's quite a drop down to the ground and then inform them that when you do the evacuations they're to leave their backpacks on the bus and their coats and all their things inform them that if they're using the back door they should not just jump out the back door from a standing position. They must sit down and then hop out. These are all things you should tell them and, and designate before you do your evacuation. Then the day of the drill, you're gonna stop the bus in a safe place. Sometimes that's the school. Um, if you're doing evacuation away from the school, you need to be able to get the bus off the road completely and have the students uh, evacuate in a safe place with not a lot of traffic. Sometimes, like I said, the school is the best option. Okay, then you're gonna open the door of the bus first, turn off the key and take the key with you. You're opening that door because after you evacuate, you've got to come back into the bus. And if the door is not open and you have the key and it's turned off, you're going to have to go back in the back door. And I'm just assuming you're using the back door for an evacuation. You do not have to use the back door for your evacuation. You can use the front door, have them walk off that bus, using the stairs and the handrails, just as they do when they're exiting at the school or at their bus stop. You do not need to use the back door as your um, practice evacuation. The kids like going out the back door because it's new, it's novel, it's interesting, and it also gives you, the driver, the opportunity to um, see how that would work, because if you had to use that back door, it is something different. Okay, then you're going to walk to the back of the bus with the key in your hand, with the front door open, and you're going to dismiss your helpers. Your helpers are going to be leaving the bus first. They're going out that back door. You have two helpers to help other people hop out 
you have one helper that's going to go to a designated place where everyone's going to gather once they get off the bus. Okay, Susie, I want you to go over to that telephone pole. That's where we're going to meet. Then at that point, you're going to let the bus full of students know where they're supposed to meet when they get off the bus. Okay, listen up. As soon as you get off the bus, I want you to go over to the telephone pole where Susie's standing. Then you're going to dismiss the passengers. If you're using the back door, you should be at the back door at this point, and you are dismissing your passengers as you walk back toward the front of the bus. So the back seats go first, second to the back, third to the back, fourth to the back. Eventually, you are back up to the front. You designate or dismiss those passengers. You walk back through the bus, checking to make sure that nobody got left, nobody is hiding. And this is to help train you that if you're in an emergency situation that you don't have someone that's scared, that's hiding in the bus. Okay, you walk back through and then you evacuate. At that point, you join the group at the telephone pole and then you all go back in the front of the bus where the door is um, that you've opened. If you have questions about this, if you haven't done one of these, please see me. We'll go through this. We can walk through it in a bus if you'd like. This is a required thing you need to do. We do these twice a year. And uh, you don't get a, an option to not do this. So we need to get this done by uh, in a couple of weeks. If it's a real evacuation, some things to think about. You're going to secure the bus and notify base. While you're doing your drill, don't call into base and say, oh, I'm doing my evacuations. You might tell the other buses around you if you're doing it at the school. But base does not need to know you're doing your drill. But if you're evacuating the bus, we need to know if it's a real evacuation. So you're securing the bus, you're opening that door, you're notifying the office. At that point, you don't have to just use that back door. If you need to get out fast, you can use the front and the back exits at the same time. The dividing line is that black line in the, on the roof of the big buses. And little buses, it's a little bit different. But um, you can dismiss the kids front and back if you need to go fast. You can use just the back. You can use just the front, depending on why you're evacuating. We evacuate if there is fire or the chance of fire. So if you think that your engine's on fire, maybe there's some steam coming up and you think it might be smoke, um, that's fine, evacuate. We'd rather have you evacuate for steam than not evacuate because you think you're going to look silly. Okay, we evacuate if you are in water. If the bus goes off the road and goes into uh, the river, the ditch, I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. If you're in an accident where your bus could get hit by oncoming vehicles, in other words, more um, collisions can happen, and you're afraid that it's, it's going to be a bad situation, you could evacuate those kids. Okay, Use your judgment. Be calm. That can be sometimes scary. Um, hard to do is stay calm. Then if it's a real evacuation, have your students move farther away from the bus. During your drills, don't make them go very far away. But if it's a real evacuation, move them away from the bus so that there's no um, chance of them getting hurt. Then evacuate quickly and as safely as possible. And we want to do that with our drill also. But when there's a little stress happening, when it's a real emergency and your adrenaline's going, 
Um, do things quickly, but do it safely. Okay, in conclusion for today, there are many things to watch for in the spring, um, as in all seasons, but the spring just seems to be a time when we have a little bit more to watch for. Please adapt to the road conditions and the weather. Um, drive safely, slow down when you need to. Continue your student management. Again, right now is the time to get back on that management track. It's time to go back over the rules, um, talk to them about windows before you have to be using them. Take care of yourself, get good rest, get some exercise, um, don't overdo it. Watch uh, allergies if you have those, take the proper medication. Be prepared if you have a field trip. Think about what you need to do to accomplish that task safely. Know where you're going. Travel safely. Watch for hazards. And then practice your evacuations. And that needs to be due and signed off by April 19th. That's a Friday. Folks, thanks for driving safely. Um, you're a great crew. Appreciate what you do each and every day. And let's put a little spring in our drive. Let's stay alert. Let's get uh, ramped up for this last couple months of school. Keep doing the best job that you can. Appreciate you. And until next month, um, if you're watching this for beach transportation, fill out your summary report and uh, we'll catch you next month. Thanks for everything.